The WWE Network, and God rest its cursed soul, was designed to open up almost the entire history of the company's wrestling exploits for fans both new and old to both enjoy and re-enjoy. However, as we all now know, opening that particular door came at a cost slightly higher than $9.99. Basically, for every pinnacle of the sport moment a la Brian at WrestleMania 30, it was just as easy to access the whole Katie Vick thing. In fact, there was so much terrible stuff that you could write a book about it, which of course we did, shocking wrestling plans you won't believe actually happened. And well, go on, since it's Christmas, we've just ordered a whole new reprint of these and they're available at whatculture.bigcartel right now. As a little festive gift, here is a hot sample of just what terrors await you within its pages. My name is Adam Cleary and these are 10, somehow only 10, shocking wrestling plans you won't believe actually happened. Number 10, Fondle Me Elmo. Ever keen to be just behind the curve, and in this case, probably behind the camera, Vince McMahon used a 1996 internet gold rush to hawk his own wares in Shotgun Saturday Night. After a sex tape featuring Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee effectively acted as a gateway for those canny with a computer, adolescent wrestling fans took to AOL looking for images of Sonny in positions almost as compromising. WWE obliged because, of course, they did, producing so many bikini shots she became a record smashing search term entirely by herself. But McMahon decided to go one further and teased Sonny's sex tape. Her partner for this? A weirdly sexualized version of Tickle Me Elmo. Yep, Sonny and Elmo. Sonny's sex tape with, with Elmo. Where, where do you even start with that? Number nine, Triple H versus Scott Steiner. In 2002, Big Papa Pump was bursting with his requisite muscle mass and charisma, but was masking drop foot syndrome, a condition that reduced his in-ring prowess to naught. In their infinite wisdom, WWE decided to hide the problem by putting him in a feud with Triple H, a man not exactly famed for carrying main event matches. Oh, and of course, they gave them both a ludicrous dick measuring buildup. I mean, it sort of worked, but the problem was they were eventually going to have to have a match, and when they inevitably butted heads at the 2003 Royal Rumble, it killed the big bad booty daddy's WWE career stone dead. 18 excruciating minutes of suplexes, literally nothing else, and a non-finish. A disaster as excruciating as it was predictable. Number 8, Raw's Guest Hosts when WWE began an aggressive rebrand of the Divas division, there were few female stars they were so keen to vindicate as much as the Bella Twins. Nepotistic acts were at play, of course, but the dues paid by the sisters during the company's guest host period of Monday Night Raw were admirable in the extreme. Almost weekly, Brie and Nikki would walk out either side of a disinterested celebrity who probably came cheap or free and needed Raw's valuable airtime to plug the living sh** out of whatever entirely unrelated product they were trying to sell at the time. No, no, that's not at all like what I'm doing here. Just, just buy the bloody book. Too often, the host was positioned with a main event star in an effort to co-op the vaunted mainstream media, but the tabloids and gossip websites never appeared even remotely bothered by the stunts. Will Forte and Kristen Wiig beating SNL dead horse McGruber, Cheech and Chong dozily going through the motions 30 years after their cinematic debut, Jeremy Priven rebranding WWE's second biggest pay-per-view as Summerfest, you truly, truly envied the dead. Number seven, the kennel from hell. Now almost a charming footnote of the Attitude Era compared to some of the bigger atrocities committed by Vince Russo, the kennel from hell was literally a steaming turd in the middle of Unforgiven 99. For Vince, more is always more, which highlights just how awful the kennel from hell had to be in order for the company to never attempt the preposterous amalgamation of their two biggest gimmick matches ever again. Like, don't get me wrong, the whole boss man feeding Al Snow his own dog was quite good, but the fact they both had to scramble through, again, literal shit and piss to escape the cage was just no, that's no. According to Mick Foley and Kevin Kelly though, the whole thing was actually a giant rib on Al Snow. Outstanding dedication to the banter, if so. Number six, the original NXT. NXT is brilliant, obviously, but the initial iteration was, oh, hang on, where's, where's my dictionary? Ah, here we are, f***ing dog shit. 
Presumably intended to be all things to all people, NXT actually offered nothing to anybody. We had metal testing party games, assault courses, and promo battles, all of which just exposed every single performer's weaknesses in front of massive crowds. You know, the exact opposite of everything pro wrestling is supposed to be. The weird mashup of talent show, reality show, and game show farmed wrestlers from Florida Championship Wrestling into major arenas for their first taste of the bright lights. But the damaging glare of NXT burned nearly every performer that suffered the indignity of being included. Number 5. The Undertaker Gets Into Character To this day, nobody's really sure who to blame for the bizarre work shoots we got during The Undertaker's tash shaving transition from company cornerstone to crackpot cult leader. Some blame Vince, who was trapped in his own angle with the dead man when he accused Mark of believing his character. Fair point, but it rendered every other storyline on the show obsolete by virtue of temporarily pulling back the curtain on the company's most iconic persona. I mean, yes, The Undertaker had his own crosses, lol, to bear, after the criticism he received for suspending Stone Cold Steve Austin on a giant symbol. What criticism, you ask? Well, because it looked an awful lot like the biblical torture doled out to a one Mr. Jesus Christ, and people do tend to get slightly sensitive about that. Number 4. Hornswoggle Okay, I've actually got it on good authority that the Swog is a really nice dude, but let's just... Right, where's that list? Winning the Cruiserweight Championship, being Vince McMahon's illegitimate son, joining DX, being revealed as Raw's anonymous general manager, necking on with AJ Lee, winning a battle royal to earn a wish from Santa Claus, who then granted him the ability to speak, dressing as a cow to compliment El Torito, being Titus O'Neil's pro in NXT Season 1, Look, don't get me wrong, fair play to Dylan Postel, who played the role with vigour and absolutely deserved the healthy living he made in WWE, but Jesus Christ, man, what was going on in the company's creative engine room? Number 3. The Diva Search Despite a noted shift towards actual wrestling, thanks to the hard work of Trish Stratus, Molly Holly, Jazz, Lita, Victoria et al., from 03 to 07, women were still hired almost entirely for their sex appeal to a diminishing adolescent audience. Jim Ross recalls being tasked with only finding, and I quote, athletic tens at the time, whilst John Laurinaitis allegedly moved the company's chief developmental league to Tampa to allow for endless beach parties alongside many of the models he'd ushered into the organization. At the heart of all this was the diva search, which forced untrained and largely untalented performers into spots they simply weren't equipped to handle. The women's division was, for a while, little more than a home for pillow fights and theme parties and eventually became an outright detriment to the product when the roster became flooded with its runners-up. Number 2. Kurt Angle Stalk Charmel. Oh god, oh not this one, please, please god, not this one. Lost in the shuffle somewhere between Kurt Angle's transformation from comedy technician to killer wrestling machine was that time he threatened to rape Booker T's wife. If that seems quite a leap, that's because it played out like one too. Within the space of weeks, Angle was suddenly a maniacal pervert, proudly harping on about bestiality sex, calling her a gutter slut, and then, you know, physically assaulting her. Despite, oh, I don't know, risking prison time in a career defined by his portrayal of a sex offender, the arc was thankfully parked when Kurt went to Raw and never gets spoken of again. Number 1. The Invasion How, how did WWE ruin what should have been the biggest storyline in wrestling history? Fantasy booking matches between the heroes and villains of WWE and WCW was, for many fans, a weekly exercise. It was the creative golden egg. But... Predictably, the rushed invasion served only to placate the delicate egos of WWE's established stars, humorlessly abusing countless youngsters in an effort to cling on to their existing spots. Sigh. Tragically, the main eventers that could have salvaged this whole mess knew their own worth and gave it a wide berth. Instead, leaving us with a final payoff match at Survivor Series that included only one person who'd come over from WCW, and a final two of The Rock versus Austin again. Oh, what could have been 